vertigo is defined as the perception of rotational or translational movement in the absence of an external stimulus. It can be of vestibular or peripheral origin or be due to non-vestibular or central causes. With regards to peripheral vertigo, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is the most common cause, accounting for over one half of all cases. It is of great importance to identify this versus other causes of vertigo as the differential diagnosis includes a spectrum of disease processes ranging from benign to life-threatening. Most cases are idiopathic in origin and probably result from degeneration of the macula in utricle. Utricular macula of inner area is the region that receives the utricular filaments of the vestibulocochlear nerve. In the right side image, you can see autoconia. They are dislodged when macular degeneration occurs. In view of the high prevalence of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo in middle-aged women, hormonal factors may play a role in the development of this disease. In a recent study, bone mineral density score was decreased in both women and men with idiopathic benign paroxysmal positional vertigo compared with that in normal controls without a history of dizziness. This suggests the involvement of deranged calcium metabolism in this condition. Secondary causes refer to identifiable causes of autoconial dislodgement. These include autologic and non-autologic surgery, head trauma, or any means by which a sufficient mechanical force reaches the inner ear. In addition, it may develop secondary to any of the inner ear diseases, for example, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, and Meniere's disease, that give rise to degeneration and detachment of the autoconia. Autoconia are also known as autoliths or canaliths. When they are dislodged, they settle within the endoleaf of the semicircular canals. When the head remains static, there is no stimulus causing the hair cells to fire. With motion, however, the displaced autoconia shift within the fluid and the subsequent stimulus is unbalanced with respect to the opposite ear inappropriately causing symptoms of dizziness, spinning, and or swaying. Hence, symptoms are profound with movement but classically lessen with rest. As with all vestibular patients, detailed clinical history is very important. Clinicians should take care to differentiate the chief complaint from other forms of dizziness such as disequilibrium and presyncope. Other causes of episodic vertigo should also be ruled out, including Meniere's disease and migraine. Ask open-ended questions to obtain the best possible description of symptoms. Ask regarding the timing of symptoms and context, as well as exacerbating and elevating factors. Inquire about recent viral infections due to association with labyrinthitis and about trauma, recent neurosurgery and medications that may be autotoxic as this may suggest an alternate diagnosis. Relapses are common, so a history of recurrent vertiginous spell suggests benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Due to age-related degeneration of the autolithic membrane, it frequently occurs in the elderly population, though close consideration must be made for central causes of vertigo, which also correlate with increasing age and cerebrovascular disease. Classically, the symptoms are sudden in onset, provoked by movement, and decreased with rest. These vertigo spells usually last less than 20 seconds. The onset of vertiginous symptoms is provoked by specific head movements, such as extending the neck, 
bending forward or rolling over in bed. The Dix Hall Pike test is a diagnostic maneuver that can be performed quickly and easily to evaluate for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It is based on the anatomical properties of the inner air which predispose displaced autoconia to settle in the posterior semicircular canal. Excitation of the posterior canal results in up beating and torsional nystagmus which indicates a positive dix Hallpike test. Theoretically, autoconia may settle in the superior or lateral semicircular canals, leading to a negative test, though with a sensitivity of 79% and specificity of 75%, this maneuver does have clinical utility. The dix Hallpike helps localize the affected air by exacerbating both symptoms and clinical signs such as nystagmus. These images demonstrate how to do the Dix Hallpike maneuver with the right air. The patient is at first seated with the head rotated at 45 degrees. Then the patient is quickly lowered into supine position with neck extended below the level of the table. With head extended, examiner observes the patient for nystagmus. It is largely a clinical diagnosis and often the battery of laboratory and imaging tests ordered only help to rule out other possibilities. Imaging of the head is unremarkable. Head CT and MRI are useful to rule out infarct, hemorrhage, masses, tumors or other pathology that would suggest alternative causes of vertigo. It is usually a self-remitting disorder and may resolve as time goes on without specific treatment. After using the Dix Hallpike maneuver to localize which site is problematic, the Epley maneuver can be performed. This series of positional changes helps dislodge autoconia from the autolytic membrane and back into the utricle, removing the disturbance and symptomatology. The original version of Epley's maneuver has been modified by other physicians for ease and simplicity. This is the demonstration of modified Epley's maneuver. After the Dix Hallpike maneuver, which is shown in A to C, the head is turned 90 degrees toward the unaffected ear, which is shown in D and the head and trunk continue turning another 90 degree in the same direction which is shown in E. The patient is then moved to the sitting position shown in F. Each position should be maintained for at least one or two minutes or until the induced nystagmus and vertigo are resolved. The Dix Hallpike and Epley are not always tolerated by patients in which case treatment is symptomatic. Antihistamines address vertigo by suppressing labyrinth excitability and vestibular end organ receptors. The antihistamine best supported in the literature for vertigo is meclizine, 25 to 100 mg daily. Vertigo associated with this disorder is typically abrupt in onset, very brief and truly paroxysmal just as the name suggests, and medications may not be particularly beneficial. Hence, routine medical management with meclizine is not indicated unless the frequency of vertigo spells is high and disruptive to daily function. Nausea and vomiting is another common complaint with this disorder and can be treated with antimetics as needed. Ondansetron, metoclopramide, or promethazine, procorperazine. It should be stressed that this is a benign disease. Operative intervention should be reserved for intractable cases or patients with severe and frequent recurrences that significantly impact the quality of life. Preoperatively, surgeons should precisely confirm the affected canal and its site. The practitioner should also rule out any secondary causes.
Preoperative testing should include audiometry given the possible complication of hearing loss from inner ear surgery. Objective vestibular testing is encouraged to establish baseline function in the operative ear and ensure normal vestibular function in the contralateral side. Imaging with CT and MRI should also be arranged for surgical planning and to rule out central lesions that may mimic benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. The surgical options are singular neurectomy and posterior semicircular canal occlusion.